very pleased to introduce you to uh, Ann Clark, who I think Brian knows. Hi, and yes, so, uh, nice to see you. Hi there. And, and uh, she's one of our panelists. Uh, Andrew Brady is another one of our panelists. Andrew, do you want to briefly introduce yourself to, uh, to Brian and Vanessa? Yeah, so I, I run a leadership development company, um, really focused on purpose-driven business and, and stakeholder capitalism or, or conscious capitalism, and have been following David's work for a while on how, how that integrates with uh, using evolutionary principles to build more cooperative organizations and economies. So, There you go. That's wonderful. And uh, Sage Gibbons, can you want to sign in and uh, introduce yourself to uh, Brian and Vanessa? Nice to meet you both. Um, I'm uh, this view of life's uh, marketing strategist and Zoom organizer in this case. Um, I'm also a uh, pro social facilitator and I'm studying um, basically urban planning and informatics, um, heavily influenced by uh, evolutionary perspectives. Nice to meet you. Okay. And we deliberately, this is the first of our webinars, monthly webinars, so it's a little bit experimental. And uh, so the idea is for there to be a panel who is not a panel of experts. So Anne is an expert in your area, but the others are not. Basically, it represents the diversity of this community that we're trying to create that's centered on an evolutionary worldview, this view of life. And that community, uh, what do they do? Well what they want to do. It's like a giant sandbox. And um, there's creating content for the online magazine and the podcast, but there's also forming uh, learning to action groups of all sorts, um, such as business, which is where Andrew um, uh, uh, comes in. And the more it, and more it leads to, the more learning uh, leads to action, and the more it passes to pro-social, our practical framework for working with groups and really putting these wonderful ideas into action. And actually, there could be no better demonstration of this than, than to be discussing your book um, on basically early human origins, you know, our, our nature as a species using the very same ideas that can apply to our current lives. So, you know, I mean, that's, that's this view of life in a nutshell. And uh, so we have uh, 84 participants that are um, already Line listening to us, we will be recording it. And uh, so, hello to everyone out there. Uh, we'll wait just a minute or two more to see who else accumulates. Um, and then uh, we'll begin by uh, having you guys uh, just give a little synopsis of your wonderful book. Uh, five, ten minutes, please. And then, uh, then there'll be a, a, a discussion with the panelists for about 20 minutes. And then we'll open it up to, uh, to, uh, Q&A with our audience. And please use the Q&A function, uh, oh, yeah. not the chat function. Although if you want to uh, uh, sign in by chat, please do so just to say uh, oh. hello and we'll make all of this available. I see uh, Peter Gray is here, uh, David Hurst. These are all people that I know uh, well as members of this community. And it's just uh, so exciting to be um, basically expanding an evolutionary worldview, not only subject-wise to anything and everything from an evolutionary perspective, but community-wise. Everyone from just, you know, truly anyone uh, can be joining this community and can be climbing that learning curve in literacy and adopting an evolutionary uh, uh, world uh, uh, view. So it uh, really is uh, just a, a great thing to be involved in. Well, uh, Sage, should we uh, should we begin? Yeah, I think I think we're good to go. People will trickle okay. in. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, people, uh, there's a sign in on uh, chat if you like, just to say hello. Uh, questions should be in the Q and A section, and then uh, let's let's begin. Uh, Brian and Vanessa, what is your book about? We, I just have one disclaimer: is that we've got like four kids and dog and a tutor. So there might be some mayhem <laughs> as we're talking, but we think, we, we think we've got it under we control. Got it, we, we got, got it. it, we got this. Our doors are locked. So um, anyway, <laughs> but thank you so much for this opportunity. We're so excited to be here. And um, I think uh, just as an admirer of your work, David, in what you do so well is um, 
getting evolution across to the public, what we wanted to do seven some years ago when we started writing the book was we wanted to correct one of the big misconceptions about evolution and uh, that phrase was survival of the fittest and it is just stunning to think how far that phrase has penetrated into all aspects of our community from the business world to um, economic policy to refinancing to um, eugenics and all the horrible things that followed there and so we wanted to sort of make to give a new understanding of exactly what Darwin meant when he wrote about survival of the fittest and then also to see if we could shift the public perspective and to understand that cooperation and friendliness is a, a much better way to do things. So, so um, uh, you know, the book is really a marriage of two things and as Vanessa said, one of the things we really wanted to accomplish with the book was to sort of shake people's thinking about evolution a little bit that, uh, you know, cooperation and friendliness are big time winning strategies in the evolutionary game or in the game of life. Um, and so we wanted to give a, a great uh, treatment to that and, and make that argument. Um, but the book is a marriage in that it's science communication plus science. Uh, and so we drew on a lot of the work from our uh, own team and uh, so uh, Vanessa did a great job at turning things that I was producing that were like broccoli and making them ice cream. So if you enjoy reading the book, it's despite me. Uh, and um, uh, but the, the work we drew on was work together with uh, that I did with my own team here at Duke, but also uh, with Richard Rangham and Mike Tomasello. Uh, and the, the question really is, what is unique about human psychology and how did it get that way? Um, and in trying to write a book about that, uh, we, we um, take on the, this new idea or I, a new version of an old idea, whichever way you want to characterize it, of self-domestication. That um, dogs and humans, uh, sorry, dogs and bonobos uh, lead us to uh, a new model of human evolution where friendliness uh, is extremely advantageous uh, and uh, we can think about the ecological context that that might occur. Uh, and then uh, the um, changes uh, that selection for friendliness has uh, throughout the body, mind, uh, et cetera. And so that's what the book is really, um, the, the scientific work that we draw on from my own area. But in doing that and seeing that we can really uh, potentially make the case that humans are the friendliest species of human to evolve, uh, and that might have given us uh, an advantage over other species of humans that also had big brains and language and um, uh, cultural abilities, or I should say linguistic abilities and uh, forms of culture, um, uh, that maybe friendliness gave us the advantage over those other species. In doing that, then it it makes you step back and reflect on, okay, well, if we're so friendly, then how do we explain uh, human cruelty? And then uh, given um, the current, uh, you know, place we find ourselves in politically, uh, the question is how can we have a friendlier future then once we understand this um, about human nature? Uh, and so that's sort of what we tried to take on in this book in uh, 50,000 words or less. Well, and the funny thing was we'd actually finished writing this book in 2016. We had a, a great draft and what we sort of left off doing was trying to convince people at the end, like, yes, we're the friendliest human, but there really is this dark side and we look like we're making great progress, but really be careful. And um, at that point, you know, Obama was the president, Hillary was going to be the next president. And then, you know, things changed very quickly and so we had to we, we kind of like threw out a third of the book and then really tried to use the theory this evolutionary theory to try and enact real world solutions and so then we had to go and look at all different sort of fields that you know it definitely wasn't Brian area and wasn't mine either and try and what concrete values and recommendations can we take on this theory that's taken like 20 years to develop and, and what impact does it have and what application does it have to um, you know the the state in which we find ourselves and to our community that's uh, interesting that you actually tailored the book to our current times that's very interesting <laughs> um, very interesting indeed well that's awesome have you completed your introduction or shall we proceed to the panel I think we're good I think yeah 
Okay, well, let's begin with, uh, with uh, Anne. Uh, Anne, what do, how would you like to kick this off? Uh, I'll uh, kick it off by asking a question that I was thinking about when I turned to the back of your jacket cover and started to read the blurbs and then look at some of the reviews. And what struck me, um, particularly since I had been reading in the chapters of our current situation, and since I teach all of these things in animal behavior, that there's always this, um, is that how differently different people in the reviews took it, or at least the part that was blurbed is what they were, what, some of them saying things that I think I would never have said after reading some of the chapters and sitting through the last days of political strife, um, which is that it gave, pe gave them real hope for humanity. And then at the other side, there's several people who are saying, yeah, really highlights those complicated, horrible aspects of our ability to, you know, find totally irrelevant aspects of somebody else and decide that that's the outgroup and treat them as you would never treat, you know, a dog, uh, so to speak. Um, and so I, I wondered if you had any comments on the kinds of responses you've gotten and that balance of people who take it glass half full, glass half empty, perhaps, um, and, and perhaps, you know, how you feel, how you react to those different reactions. Right, well, I, I think when, um, you know, we were really trying to apply the self-domestication hypothesis, we were really looking for hope for ourselves. And I think one of the important things about, um, about science communication is understanding why we are the way we are. And that when you misdiagnose why people are behaving the way they are, you know, for example, like, oh, it's a, it's a particular culture or it's this demographic that's going to react in that way, or it's because of, you know, this education or that. It's, it's, it's when it's, um, when you don't understand why something is happening, then it becomes very difficult to then correct the events that are happening. And I think that's one of the reasons why history repeats itself. Um, Brian? Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I do, uh, I think that people, it is a little bit of a roar shot. People can uh, see uh, either the kindness or cruelty in our species, and they're both definitely there. And so I think that might be slightly reflected in those responses. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think the overall um, message, though, in the book is to echo a little bit of what Vanessa was saying. Once you can step back and think about human nature um, and what it is, um, then uh, you can start ruling out some, some potential strategies and solutions that people have proposed uh, in the past uh, or even are trying to implement today. Uh, if you're trying to encourage friendliness and more success. I think the other thing is that um, you see where there is plasticity, where there is uh, uh, hope for change. You can see when in, in a, a human's life or a group, uh, you can have that change occur. Um, and where, uh, you know, who, who might be um, uh, open to change or who might be affected most by change. But that there's, uh, you know, it takes, I, I think the one thing we learn is the, you know, sort of the darkest part of human nature, uh, the argument that there's just some bad apples out there that have the psychology that allow for the worst in human nature to be expressed. Um, I think that gets pretty wholeheartedly rejected. Um, and so then that, that sort of changes the mindset about what's the strategy going forward. And so, um, but I agree with you, it is a little bit of a roar shot because I've had people say to me, after I read your book, it could have been, you know, we're, we're the cruelest species that evolved. Um, but I think, I, I think my response to that is because we start from dog domestication and we know that selection for friendliness is uh, a pattern that, or sorry, creates a pattern of changes that's recognizable, um, that's why we think the selection was for friendliness, not for increases in cruelty as the initial selection pressure. Well, if I could jump in, I think that the fundamental message there, and it's made as well by uh, Richard Wangham, your mentor in his book, The Goodness Paradox, 
is that, um, you know, within group cooperation and between group competition are joined at the hip, mm -hmm. joined at the hip. And so it's no paradox that people would be cooperative within their groups and hostile between, uh, uh, between groups. And so often it centers on the scale of, of cooperation. What made, what made humans different is not, not, not cooperation per se, which always often takes place at at least some scale, but that the scale might be expanded, already has expanded, as we know from, from Peter Turchin's work and the last 10,000 years of cultural evolution uh, and could be expanded still or could contract. And so I think that, that that awareness of being joined at the hip and that what we really need to do is, is where those boundaries are that, that demarcate is, is I think one of the most, and you know, compared to the bad apple theory, which is just, you know, it's just not literate, uh, uh, not evolutionarily. Uh, Literate. Well, let's go on to Andrew. Uh, Andrew, you want to jump in here? Yeah, thanks, David. Um, I, I just was fascinated uh, reading through the book, as I was mentioning before we got started. I kind of am always looking at this through the kind of business and, and, and capitalism lens. And so one of the things that, that I thought was really interesting, you were talking about how, you know, before there was an, an ability to accumulate when, you know, no crops, no refrigerators, banks or governments. It was the social bonds that were the, the insurance uh, that, that would kind of tie that, that small group together. And so just kind of thinking about and in, in wrestling with a little bit, some of the ways that, that we, uh, you know, both personally, but, but also as a, as a society and, and in our economy, you know, try to, try to, I guess, I guess hoard resources, you know, to, to keep them for, uh, in, in case of, uh, I don't know, a pandemic or something like that, um, you know, in those sorts of things. But then how do we balance, how do we balance this kind of need for, for scarcity and abundance? Because on the other side, I've, you know, seen a lot of people talk about how when, uh, you know, for example, when, when people are going hungry, that, that it's, not a, it's not a food production problem. We actually produce plenty of food. You know, there's plenty of abundance. It's a food distribution problem. And so trying to balance, um, you know, this, this scarcity versus abundance and and what, what ways do you see we could, I guess, uh, you know, make, a, make a, better, uh, a, a better balance of those, those two ends of things? You want me to try? Yeah. Okay. So that's a tough question. Um, uh, but I think it's an important one. I mean, I, maybe the way to think about it is, um, first of all, you know, sort of the work you're highlighting there, we were drawing on lots of other people's work. Um, and I don't think we said anything fundamentally original there that uh, hunter-gatherers, um, you know, obviously had limited storage other than their social capital um, relative to what we experience here. But I do think the, maybe the mismatch um, is uh, the scale of groups. And so, you know, now we have um, all of humanity that you're worried about. Uh, and, you know, if you were to step back 10,000 or 15,000 years ago, um, you know, all of humanity, you would be maybe a few hundred or a few thousand people. Um, and so I think that's the fundamental challenge is um, having our circle of concern uh, expand beyond uh, not only our kin, not only our group, not only our neighboring groups, um, but but people will never meet and never see and um, uh, often politically can be framed as um, threatening competitors. Um, and so uh, that will be the recurring problem. Uh, and so when we're, you know, when we feel threatened, uh, we have evolved to try to protect those we care about. Um, it's not just our kin or just ourselves, it's also our group. Um, and so, uh, you know, you're trying to, you know, that motivates people to try to keep things for their own group. And so then that diminishes our ability to care about all humans. Um, and so I, I, I don't have a solution, um, uh, you know, for the distribution specifically problem, but I think in general, what we try to do back in the, in the book is, for instance, we were talking about problems for democracy and so many specific problems with you know democracy in the united states everything from uh gerrymandering to um uh you know arguments about um uh the work week in washington 
uh, you know, corruption of, uh, you know, spending on campaigns, et cetera, et cetera, lobbyists, blah, blah, blah. And what we try to do is kind of step back and say, well, actually, we think the fundamental problem is that problem we were just talking about, which is, um, you know, this within group, between group dynamic, um, but not just that um, we're like other species, but we actually take it a little bit further because one of the things that happens when you study chimps and bonobos is you realize that yes, they have group competition and yes, one of them has a positive response to strangers and one of them has a negative response to strangers, but that's all based on familiarity or un being unfamiliar. Whereas with humans, there's this group identity. We have this new level of group um, and so uh, how to construct our societies and our world to take advantage of our potential for recognizing strangers as group members versus potentially not even seeing them in human is the fundamental challenge we have. And if I could just add to that, it's also really costly to hoard. Um, so, I mean, if you're going to hoard all the capital and all the resources, I mean, that creates its own kind of stress. And if you do that, to a significant extent, then you're also going to cut off your potential to work with other group members because the higher you go up, the smaller is the pool of people that you're able to cooperate with without sharing. And just, um, I thought one of um, the, some of the research that, that um, Brian was talking about before was also in hunter gatherers, is that, okay, I might get this one so you can jump in, um, is that it's not that, so the hunters who come back with the meat, there's often all this talk about um, hunter-gatherers being really egalitarian, but the hunters who come back with the meat have already had their, cal their calorie intake. So it's not that they well, come back, Hadza. it's a Hadza. So that it's not that they come back yeah. and they share everything. And so I think it's, it's also a question of scale and it's a sort of like a question of, you know, extremes, like how much do you share your resources? And then, you know, how much do you give and how much do you keep? And so, so I just, I love that story because it's like, well, they're already full and then, but then they share. And so, you know, it's like, it's not kind of like all or nothing. I was like, oh, I don't know. That was just super interesting to me. I want to, uh, to me, there's a uh, interesting, I love the idea later in the book of this uh, intergroup stranger. And when we're talking about these kind of signals um, that one can get just from looking at somebody to tell whether they're part of one's group. I mean, we're talking about cultural kind of symbolic identities here. Um, this question of scale comes up again. I mean, to me, that seems a, a, uh, a great, a great way out of this kind of situation. The fact that we can identify um, people who we've never met and relate to them in a positive or pro-social way. Um, on the other hand, of course, it is rooted to some identity. So this is contingent. Um, but then there's the question of, I guess, I mean, in the book, the examples given um, definitely seem to relate more to the hunter-gatherer scale, just in terms of dress. You know, we're talking about very small scale differences that you know could make or break but if we're thinking about a country or more at a global level or just 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 beyond in this kind of modern context um i wonder what what the limits i guess of that is because it seems like you could imagine finding ways to create signals that um are basically at higher scales that that yeah, i mean i think of times of global unity. I mean, you can think of like the Axis and the Allies. I mean, the, there's like times like that where arguably the, the sub-level differences are just so background and at least at the national level, certainly. So there's certainly moments, but this, this it seems like the, the best examples um, of raising the scale always are associated with some degree of intergroup conflict. And is there, is there, Maybe that's just something that we have to kind of hijack or, you know, perhaps there's something, there's just a limit to basically how high you can scale these things without. Yeah. If I could, if I could jump in, I think that um, the, and it gets back to actually all the way back to Darwin, when we talk about uh, survival of the fittest. And one of the things that's really interesting is to take a deep scholarly dive into the reaction to Darwinism from the very beginning. And T-ball is a great place to, to start. Um, and what you learn is that the very first people to seize upon Darwin's theory of evolution were the socialists, the people that, for, like Peter Kropotkin. It was they who said, wow, I love this theory because it means that church and king are not just, you know, 
ordained. Uh, and survival of the fittest, you know, accentuating the competitive part came a little bit later. Darwin himself was so strong, as you know, about the sympathy and moral and so on. I mean, cooperation was the signature human adaptation for, um, uh, for um, um, uh, Darwin. So uh, anyhow, it's, um, uh, it's, uh, it kind of goes on from, from there. Uh, Sage, do you want to say more? Uh, we've all had our turn, actually. Let's have a little free-for-all. We have about 12 more minutes of, um, of panel discussion. And actually, let me jump in with my own main question that I have prepared for you, uh, which is that, um, uh, first of all, let me praise you for writing a beautifully written book. So I don't know if uh, maybe that goes to Vanessa, but it's uh, uh, a, pleasure to, uh, a pleasure to read. And of course, I know writing trade books myself, that you need to tell a good story, it needs to be a strong narrative and so on. Whereas science itself is so much more speculative and, <clears throat> and filled with uh, disagreements. And so what I wanted to ask you is to kind of switch mindsets and to talk a little bit about among the experts, what are the biggest zones of disagreement? Oh my God. I mean, like literally almost every area of research that we <laughs> use to build the case for self-domestication. It was so hot for Brian. We it could, was so hot. He just wanted to have like, but see all these people. Uh, everything, <laughs> everything. Too. I mean, there, I could have written a, I could have written another book about all the, all the different areas that would disagree with every thing that is used to build up the case for self-domestication. So, um, uh, there's, uh, just to start out, I mean, the fox, in the case of the foxes, which are sort of pivotal, uh, trying to make the case for this self-domestication or selection for friendliness, uh, s focusing on a change in development that has a cascade of effects on the phenotype, everything from body to mind being altered because of a developmental pathway being changed due to selection for friendliness. Uh, there's a paper uh, by uh, Gregor Larson and colleagues uh, arguing that maybe the Fox work uh, didn't have all the byproducts um, that have been proposed by my colleagues in Russia. Uh, our bonobo work, um, you know, people have argued that, um, you know, maybe characterizing bonobos as less aggressive uh, is not uh, an accurate characterization. Um, you know, the um, theory of mind being related to um, uh, dehumanization, which we make the case that dehumanization is um, uh, sort of the darkest part of our nature and um, often ignored um, in uh, explanations of why we struggle between groups. Uh, usually it's conformity, authority, and prejudice that are highlighted and dehumanization is sort of left out of the milieu. Um, we make the case that dehumanization is really a product of our friendliness um, because as you have more empathy and concern for those outside your group um, or strangers, um, there has to be a way to switch that off when you become competitive and that's then what allows for dehumanization. David Livingston Smith, uh, a wonderful philosopher out of Maine, has made the case that actually um, you know, theory of mind is not really necessary for dehumanization. It's really just a case of essentialism and um, looking at uh, people in a more hierarchical, uh, or groups in a more hierarchical sense where there can be superior and inferior groups. So, I mean, I could keep going. Um, I mean, we land on the contact hypothesis where cross-group friendships, where you have friendships between groups really is the solution. Um, for uh, better intergroup relations and uh, uh, immunizing against dehumanization and then the worst consequences of that um, being violence and potentially even warfare. Um, there, there are, um, you know, critiques of that literature, which to me, uh, you know, they're meta-analyses of how it's robustly been demonstrated. Uh, they're, sorry, they're meta-analyses of the meta-analyses of how robustly it's been demonstrated, but they're critiques of that literature. Uh, you know, how, how impactful is it? Does it work on the, the least tolerant? Um, uh, do you have to, when, when in life will it have its biggest effect? So, absolutely. Uh, Everything. 
this is so it's like uh, it's like it's like uh, laws and laws and, and sausages here so so uh, so let's have a quick round again and just uh, maybe um, um, our panelists just throw stuff out uh, um, each one of you and then we'll have then we'll have you guys respond during our next seven minutes and you want to go for it I had a, yeah I had a follow-up um, I mean it fit right in with what you were saying and of course, there are many, many places where, you know, I think the literature disagrees with something you've said or something like that. But um, obviously what the real important key issue is, is how important any of those truth, not truth, whatever it means, facts, not facts, is to the overall argument. And so I had one because I'm intensely curious about, you know, we've had this incredible explosion of understanding of Neanderthals. And Neanderthals come in, you know, as part of fascinating part of the story. Um, and um, I was just going to take it from the point, that point of view. Okay, we, we have lots of inferences as well as things we think we know about and Neanderthals now, given that we've reinterpreted some of their genetic similarities and differences. And, and we know something of their population sizes and we know that we inter, interbred with them and all that sort of thing. But how, um, in terms of the story of human, of homo replacement of homo, or extinguishing other homo species, the sapiens extinguishing others, perhaps, or I should say, other homo going extinct in the context of homo sapiens, which is really what we do know. Um, how essential do you think it is that Neanderthals were essentially different from us in degrees of self-domestication and some other aspects of their kind of uh, neoteny sophistication with respect to communication or whatever. I mean, you could, could you tell a different story where they're much more like us? And still that story would be completely continuous with the basic theme. Well, I was surprised, um, you know, when we were looking into the Angels, how similar they were. And so, I mean, really that was the standing out point for us is that well if they were so similar if there was this you know neanderthal had been found with three thousand shells stitched on his clothing if there was evidence for flowers at their burials and you know if they have fox p2 um which savante pavo thinks might be involved in language then then they were the real surprise for me it's like well i mean they were so similar and so close um, then it really can't be the things that I'd heard traditionally that, about why we were successful, that we were better hunters. It's like, there's no way, like Neanderthals could like take down a saber-toothed cat with a thrusting spear. Like they, they were the hyper carnivores of the day. Um, you know, and then speaking to Ch Steve Churchill about, you know, how when we were like cold, because we didn't have, you know, the right materials where we would just kind of like run back down towards the south and the Neanderthals with their, you know, super snug clothing would take up places. So, I, I mean, I think that um, what stood out to me was that they were so similar and in some ways so advanced, um, then really what was it that allowed us to flourish? I mean, I guess what I was thinking was in some sense as following up again as what you're saying, um, the fact that they succeeded in all at all in making it in those Nordic, you know, northern climes and whatnot, I bet. And if their populations never got very big, then they're just testimonial to success of the exact kinds of selection that we underwent. Only their populations were very small, very susceptible. God knows what happened, and we replaced them, but we replaced them with all of the same essential ingredients. Just you know, a little later and under slightly different conditions. So, so, yeah, that's a re I think that's a reasonable null hypothesis. Um, uh, I would just add, you know, the, the magic ingredient I guess we're proposing is somehow we became slightly friendlier and we could recognize um, strangers as group members, which would allow us to um, learn from each other. Uh, you're networking minds of innovators together in a way that Neanderthals couldn't we're proposing, um, and that then, the ratchet effect uh, that Mike Tomasella has famously talked about 
um, really goes into hyper um, uh, drive or hyper speed, whatever. Um, and we become ultra social in that we're exchanging knowledge and technology. And so we don't have to um, have a physical adaptation to the climates in uh, those regions that Neanderthals have been successful um, uh, inhabiting. We had cultural um, evolution uh, that could happen much faster. And so you have larger groups that are more technologically savvy. Um, uh, and the argument is it's a new type of cooperation that happened because of a new type of friendliness. Um, so, so uh, you know, how testable that hypothesis is, is another question. Um, but we try to provide some um, tests that have already happened and then uh, propose some future tests. I'm, I'm very excited about white sclera. Let me, uh, the white sclera, the sclera hypothesis. So, oh, so many things to contest. The digit <laughs> ratio, so many things to contest. And, uh, <laughs> but let's have a really quick uh, final round with uh, Andrew and, uh, and Sage, and then we're going to turn it to uh, Q&A. And I can tell you this is tough for me because I want to jump in with this, but I'm, I'm trying to cl cling to my role as moderator. So, uh, so Andrew You're and Sage. You're in different rooms, so. <laughs> You're doing good, David. Well, one of the things that I found interesting, and I was looking ahead to some of the audience questions too, that, uh, you know, it, it kind of pops up a little bit. Um, but I don't know if you ever run across the book, uh, Darren Asimoglu and, and James Robinson wrote Why Nations Fail. And it basically talks about how um, when, when economic institutions get extractive, you know, those with a lot of money are able to set up the, the political institutions to be more extractive. And it kind of becomes like, uh, you know, a, a downward spiral. And on the other end, you know, if you have more inclusive, both political and economic institutions, that can also be kind of self-reinforcing. And so I was kind of thinking about that but then also thinking about where we are in our world today, where, you know, we have really high levels of, of inequality, um, you know, the, the, the political situation that we're dealing with. And, and also, uh, I, I, I'm here in Rochester, New York, and, and Frederick Douglass is a proud, proud son of Rochester, New York, and it has that quote about how power concedes nothing without a demand. So how do we kind of like shift the, the selection pressures or how do, we, how do we, you know, convince those that are, that are in power and maybe doing it in a more extractive way um, that they should be more more cooperative. I mean, I'll I'll, I'll certainly pass out the book, but but is, is there is there any other ideas that well, you have? Andrew, on how to get Andrew, them? let me let me. That's one of the questions from our Q and A. So if we could defer that, sure. uh, we'll get right back to it in the Q and A section. So so uh, uh, right away, I promise. So um, uh, Sage, do you want to have a final parting thought before we get to Q and A? Yeah, I guess there's just one kind of technical piece here that um, I'm still wrestling with, and I and it has to do with dehumanization versus prejudice. Um, in the book, it you uh, cite some some work that shows that for one, dehumanization is a better predictor or just a better um, scale for the kind of you know discriminatory behaviors or prejudice, basically behaviors that we would normally describe as prejudiced or discriminatory. Um, and the key insight is that dehumanization doesn't require having some sort of learned negative feeling. Like you don't even, you could dehumanize someone you just met and have no preconceived notion of them um, rather than what we think of as prejudice and discrimination where there is some existing negative thought or feeling and that that's kind of what's underneath. So um, it seems to me that's like a really important uh, distinction um, when we're thinking about sort of the darker side of what this all comes down to. And, and the fact that um, to the extent that contact theory is about building positive connections and relationships, it does seem like the, the, the ease at which we can fall into a kind of dehumanization and our theory of mind just, just darkens essentially. Um, so it seems like it takes more effort basically to have positive associations and that you don't even need negative associations. You just need to have something that cues or signals something for you to dehumanize. It could just be any, it could be anything really. It doesn't have to have any learned reinforcement. Group identity is too advanced. So I guess maybe could you just speak on that distinction and, and how you see it fits into these kind of broader discussions? Uh, yeah, I just have, I'll, I'll let Brian take this one, but I just, um, yeah, I was also fascinated with the same thing. And I think that this, field of research is so new 
that, um, you know, people are still parsing this, but Lasana Harris in particular argues that prejudice and dehumanization take different pathways in the brain. Um, and then the other thing I would argue is that um, humanizing can also be very rapid and we can also humanize people without having any preconceived notions and ideas. And I think one of the special things about being human is that both these things are so plastic. I think as David said, because they're both part of the same, they're just flip sides of the same coin. So, so I think your point about um, uh, prejudice and dehumanization being distinct um, is one of the things we struggled with the most in trying to understand what the literature is and what the tests are. And, and um, just quickly to say that um, I think in social psychology, a lot of the emphasis has been on um, prejudice where you have a dislike of a group and you can even dislike your own group. Um, and that can have a lot of problems with people having self-esteem issues. Um, and so that's where a lot of the emphasis has been, um, uh, especially in clinical psychology. Um, dehumanization was first demonstrated in uh, the year after Milgram's um, monograph, Obedience to Authority, was published. Um, and no one has heard of Albert Bandura's experiment. I invite all of you to go look it up. Uh, it is a brilliant experiment. And what has replicated again and again and again um, in modern versions of the experiment, and this is probably the most important thing to know about dehumanization that is so relevant to understanding right now, is the pattern is if you hear that the group that you de dehumanize is being harmed, you want them to be harmed more by whatever that is that's harming them. So if you hear in the news that COVID is affecting a population that you happen to dehumanize, then you want them to have more COVID. If you hear that a population that's been, that you dehumanize is suffering from inequality, then you support policies that will allow for more inequality. If you hear that a group that you dehumanize is um, being uh, um, uh, executed at, at too high of a rate or that there's, there's injustice in the justice system specifically to a population that you dehumanize, you actually support the policies that will um, cause that to happen more. And measures of prejudice are not aligned with those preferences. Prejudice does not predict those policy preferences. Okay, that was great. That was very articulate and passionate. Well, now we'll sort of proceed to the uh, uh, Q&As and get right back to uh, Andrew's question with uh, another Andrew, Andy Norman. And Andy um, has his own discussion group on, on T-Ball called Examined Lives, which just started up. And actually the first session was um, a discussion of Humankind, a book which is very much in the same oh, yeah. genre as, um, as your book. So I highly recommend Andy's uh, discussion group, Examined Lives. And his question is, uh, right back to Andrew's question, what would, it, what would it look like to replicate survival of the friendliest selection pressures in, say, the business world? Can we select out cutthroat capitalism? So there is back to Andrew's question. Uh, yeah, so what, what that reminds me of, I didn't know if you wanted to go first, but okay, all right. So what, it, what, what that question reminds me of is um, what we, actually the first opening of the book is talking about the jigsaw method of um, teaching cooperative learning techniques. Um, and so uh, Aaron Aronson um, uh, came up with this brilliant method where in classrooms, um, instead of it being uh, zero sum where everybody's trying to get the highest grade and you're competing against everybody else in your class potentially, um, two to three hours a week, there's basically what is the equivalent of a team learning exercise where every person on in your group is responsible for a different part of the assignment. And you cannot pass and get a good grade unless all of the teammates help you learn the different parts that they're responsible for. So you're no longer competing with your teammate, you actually need them to be successful. And what was found was that interdependence where you actually need the other people in your class, even for a few hours a week, um, reduced the competitive atmosphere, increased the cross group friendships, it led to higher uh, performance in school and it led to people showing up at school more. Um, and so, 
Uh, I don't, I, I would say the lesson there may not be that, you know, competition needs to just completely go away and, and be got rid of. It's that it just can't always be only zero sum competition that we are, um, you know, uh, experiencing or um, educating or working uh, in business uh, together with. Yeah, and um, um, I want to be brisk, actually, so we can get through a bunch of uh, 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 as many questions as, um, as possible. But it does bear saying that uh, cultural evolution requires change. I mean, new things have to replace old things. That's competition. I mean, it has to be, and that's competition in what Darwin called the large and metaphorical sense. Not necessarily cutthroat competition, not necessarily zero sum, but it is the case for evolution to occur. New things have to replace old things. Let's make those new things the pro-social things as opposed to the, uh, the uh, destructive things. Well, Steve Gilbert asks, um, are females friendlier than males? In Bonobos, yes. <laughs> um, I don't know the gender differences in friendliness. Uh, I get, is that specific? I will point out that all the countries with females in charge don't have any COVID. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if I don't know if that question was specific to humans or other species, um, but but what I would say is um, uh, l there are many species where females dominate. Um, so lemurs are female dominant, hyenas are female dominant, and it just means that the females have been hyper masculized and they've become more male like. Um, in the sense that they're larger, and in fact, their genitalia have been masculinized. Um, yes, the females are in charge in those species, um, but basically they've just become male-like. I think the case of bonobos is particularly interesting because I don't think that's what's happened. I think that females, female bonobos are very much like female chimpanzees. I think male bonobos have been selected to be less aggressive. Um, and so it's not that um, they've been juvenilized or perhaps feminized. Um, so I think that's the interesting dynamic that's going to be fun to work out as we keep going. And the interesting thing about bonobos is that the females cooperate and they, and they do use aggression, but they use it to maintain the peace and to stop any male from becoming dominant and aggressive. However, you, you need to consult your average middle school girl about that question because that is deadly. Yes. And I've seen that in other animals. They're quieter about their aggression. Well, I mean, the point is, is that pro-social and anti-social strategies exist in both sexes. And which ones becomes in the forefront is highly contextual, highly contextual. I mean, even the story about the bone boats, why are the females more cooperative? It's because they've got lots of food to eat. If they were placed in a if they were placed in a food poor situation, then they'd become uh, competitive, and so on, and so on, and so forth. So there can be there's no intrinsic difference between males and females. Males and females alike are shaped by selection pressures, and uh, and any difference that exists is is due to the selection pressures that they've been subjected to, whether whether cultural, genetic, or or personal would be my answer to that uh, my answer to that question. Well, here's a real softball. <laughs> question from J.T. Belkovsky. Uh, Brian and Vanessa, what was your favorite part of the book to write? Oh, thank you, J.T. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the last the acknowledgments, like when it was done. <laughs> what about yours? Uh, well, I, th I thought, uh, you know, I always find the part that I, is not our own research is the most fun because you're learning and really grappling with new material. Um, and I learned about a whole bunch of new scientists I didn't know about and whole areas of research I didn't know about. Um, you know, everybody from uh, Noor, Noor Kataili uh, and Emile Brunet, uh, who unfortunately, um, I think he just died uh, this week. I'm so sorry to report. And I say that just because um, uh, he is amazing and you can go look up his work. Um, and uh, Gordon Hodson, uh, all of these people working on uh, intergroup relations in a way that when, if you're ensconced in evolutionary biology, you may not encounter them, but their work is so relevant to uh, thinking about human interaction. Um, and so that was really fun. And then also the idea that um, I, I think the other really fun thing, and I'll finish, is that how we perceive animals and, and, and nature may be 
fundamental to how we perceive each other and how we can have a friendlier future. That was sort of a fun idea I wasn't expecting to encounter. And actually, just to, yeah. to jump on that, I also like the or the architecture. There's this just piece in the book about how architecture influences how we either live together or how we separate one another. And I found that fascinating. It just made me look at everything in a much more different way. Oh, and I can uh, give a shout out to Marcel Harmon, uh, a T-Ball 1000 member who is in the building industry and has a whole special issue of uh -huh. T-Ball on the uh, built environment from an evolutionary oh, perspective. That. So um, awesome. Now, I apologize that we can't address every question, but the next one comes from Andrew Atkinson. Hi, I wonder if uh, you'd be prepared to say something about how the social brain hypothesis also supposes theory of mind to be a tool for Machiavellian purposes, such that it's also the selfish and mean who went out from time to time. Uh, indeed, uh, there is much also to where we've come from. And uh, let me just tack on to that, the historical fact, I think, that when the idea of Machiavellian intelligence was first proposed, it was very much a kind of a within group competitive phenomenon as it was imagine how you're gonna beat out somebody else in your, in your group as opposed to how you might be friendly with the group. So I'm, I'm very interested in your answer to this question myself. <laughs> um, well, maybe I haven't uh, grappled with it fully uh, yet, but uh, you know, I, I guess where it's easy for me to, um, uh, you know, I think has there been selection for competitive advantage? Uh, you know, when you're competing for resources or mates within your group, I, I would uh, suggest perhaps. Uh, I, I think that's a hypothesis worth testing uh, and evaluating. But what I'm also excited about um, uh, the fact that you can have selection for friendliness. One of the, my favorite examples in the book is um, cleaner wraps. So cleaner RAS, just, it, it, it's so hard to be, uh, you know, what do you mean by friendliness? What's your definition? But I think cleaner RAS so nicely encapsulate, you know, really what we've been talking about the whole time. If you're a cleaner RAS, you are a tiny little fish and you are attracted to interact in a pro-social friendly way with a predator that should eat you. And so an entire cooperative relationship their psychology has been completely shaped by the fact that their fear of a predator was altered to be an attraction to the mouth that should chew them up and swallow them. So you, it's clear that there can be selection for friendliness that can have uh, an, uh, you know, an equal powerful force. So I think you can have selection for Machiavellian intelligence and that's a hypothesis we should evaluate in animals. Um, and I think uh, selection for friendliness too. Um, so, uh, and then the question is when and what ecological context might they act and then what role they play in humans. Uh, and I think since we're, um, you know, uh, I think also nested in this family of other humans, uh, I, I don't know, I kind of fall on the, I think it's the friendliness that might have had the big impact late in human evolution to make us outcompete the other human species. But, but I think again, those are both viable hypotheses. Right. Now a quick time check. Uh, we started five minutes late, so I propose going five minutes late. We'll end at uh, 1.05 if that's okay. If people have to drop off, then so be it. Um, and so um, uh, 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 Pate Skein asks, um, you touched earlier on the question of scaling from hunter-gatherer to larger social units. Could you say more about the role of institutions, religion, law, and legal systems in maintaining cooperation and the emergence of states and markets. Um, do you want me to do that really quick? Well, real quickly, I can say that I think that democracies are really, they're what gets it done. And there's been lots of attacks on our democracy over, you know, in, in the recent past. And just, I, was it Churchill's? Like, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think in terms of um, states and what it is that works best, that democracy really do, does, is the winner in terms of really harnessing the better angels of our nature and also allowing those more minority voices to, to have a place. Uh, that's a pretty good answer. I'll go with that. <laughs> well, I could point to religions also. The work of Peter Turchin is important here. And in fact, uh, the whole axial age religions, the made, all the major religions, uh, served as a social glue to hold society together at a much larger scale than before. 
but always in the context of, of between group conflict warfare at a still larger scale. So the idea that within group cooperation and between group conflict are joined at the hip explains the entire march of human history, including religions and institutions and so on, because at that scale, you could not have cooperative society without those things. And not only democracy, democratic, but also, I mean, monarchies and, and, and you know, the, the whole thing is needed. A multi-layer institutional culture has to exist to, for society to be cooperative at that at that scale. And some of it looks like friendliness, some of it doesn't. I mean, I mean, so, you know, the mapping of friendliness onto cooperation, especially at that scale, is a complex mapping to say the, uh, uh, to say the uh, uh, least. So uh, uh, let me uh, zip ahead here. Um, and then actually, H. Uh, Dieter uh, Scutellis actually uh, brings up Peter. Let me see if there's more about this. In writing your book and connecting it to current events, did you have a chance to consult the historian Peter Turchin's work, especially his recent 2016 book, Ages of Discord, which is about American history. His arguments about the 200 year cycles of civilization are powerful and disturbing as they very well match what is happening in our country right now. So shout out to Peter Turchin. And then uh, uh, um, I know you're familiar with Peter's work. I, I'm not sure if you've read Ages of Discourse, but what would you like to say about Peter's work? Well, well just that when we were struggling to make the case for um, transitions of societal organization from, you know, small scale hunter-gatherer foraging populations, and then you have, um, you know, chieftains and uh, tribal chieftains, and then on to nation states, but then you have these democracies and then even uh, international institu institutionalization. So what, you know, how do you uh, explain uh, that progress? And then how do you explain the conflict within uh, large scale institutions? And so um, we really emphasized uh, uh, Churchin's um, argument that, you know, sort of primates are in general more despotic than say hunter gatherers and hunter gatherers would be more on the egalitarian end of the spectrum. But when you have, um, when you leave and have a higher level organization with agriculture, things become more despotic. And then it's not until you have uh, liberal democracies that things sort of shift more towards uh, a more egalitarian state. And that it's really a liberal democracy that allows groups to, instead of having one group always ruling over another, you can have this kind of compromise um, and a return to a level of egalitarianism. But the, but I think the disturbing part in the Age of Discord is this uh, case where there's this elite overproduction hypothesis. Yeah. Um, and and so uh, the, it, it's that is something that you know as you're watching everything going on, you can't help but be thinking about that um, you have um, uh, basically uh, uh, a class of uh, elites that are in in a fight that has repercussions for everyone. Uh, and it's their intergroup tribalism uh, that may be driving a lot of the, the conflict within a nation state. Um, and so uh, definitely a fascinating hypothesis backed up by a lot of data. Well, the comparison with cancer is compelling and disturbing because cancer is nothing other than selection within multicellular organisms for disruptive uh, uh, cellular uh, strategies. And if something as well organized as a multicellular organism is susceptible to cancer, then if you take something which is much more crudely a superorganism, such as a human society, it too is susceptible to cancerous social strategies. Self serving strategies will originate just as they do with cancer, and they will spread if there's not cancer prevention mechanisms. And the need for social control, the social equivalent of cancer prevention, is something which is very sobering to, to think about. Be, there, there could be no organism without social control. That goes for multicellular organisms and it goes for, for human uh, societies. Well, we're gonna end with another softball question. Uh, from- uh, How friendly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, from uh, JT Velikovsky, uh, Brian and Vanessa, and David and panelists. Uh, is there one book in particular that has shaped your world of you or has influenced you and your work the most? 
Oh, I'll let the panelists go first. I mean, yeah. no, 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 it's on you. Oh, it's on us. Okay, the, the question's in panelists. Uh, I mean, so I'm looking up at my bookshelf, there's so many. Uh, do you want to go first? I yeah, mean, you think it, you're like David Livingston Smith. Uh, yeah, I yeah. would read, I would read uh, Inhumanity by David Livingston Smith. It's a very short read on dehumanization. Um, uh, and that is a really uh, good one. Uh, I would say uh, David Stasevich, uh his new book, uh, the, the Rise and Decline of Democracy. Uh, another fascinating read. Um, and then I would also, if you're into anthropology, um, is it the gods? Oh, there it is right there. Yeah. Um, I just want to make sure I get the, yeah, the gods of the upper air. That one was uh, sort of a, shook me to my core on sort of the history of the competing schools in anthropology and one that really emphasized group superiority and another led more by Boaz uh, that was more uh, an egalitarian or uh, less colonialist approach that, and seeing where, and thinking about where your schools of thought originated and where they were from, that was kind of a, an amazing uh, historical trip. I'm gonna go with Lord of the Rings, I think. I'm gonna go backwards. <laughs> yes, I've been thinking about it a lot because it's all about the journey um, and the journey is long and life is hard. But I also love it how Gandalf just gathers all these disparate elements. Like, I mean, you know, you're just talking about group friendships, like the talking trees and the hobbits and how they, and the humans and how they're all ready to come together to serve a higher purpose. And Sage, to your point, it is to fight an evil overlord. And sometimes I have conversations with Mike Tomasello about, gosh, if only climate change had eyeballs, like it'd be so easy to kind of like <laughs> pivot and fight. So yeah, I, I love Lord of the Rings. Awesome. Well, this is uh, precisely the level of discourse that we strive for over here at this view of life. And, um, and so if you like it, and also if you want to move it to action, then please join us. Uh, just type T-Ball 1000 and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, um, we'll um, follow up basically with the uh, recording. This will be available to, the, to um, everyone. And uh, Brian and Vanessa, thank you so much, first for writing the book, and secondly, for spending uh, your time with us. Thank you, thank David. You. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Sage and Anne. Thank you, Anne, Sage. Sure, thank you, guys. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining up.